It's Monday, the 26th of November. My name's Juan Brown. You're watching the Blanco Lirio channel. The temporary flight restriction for the campfire was lifted last night, and I was able to get up today and take a look at the devastation, and it's huge. We've had over six to seven inches of rain over this Thanksgiving weekend, effectively putting an end to this year's fire season, we hope, here in Northern California. And we're expecting more rain tomorrow, Tuesday. This should get us back into our regular winter rain season pattern. To date, the campfires consumed 153,000 acres. There are confirmed 85 fatalities. The structures, number of structures total are over 18,000. That's about almost 14,000 residents and over 4,000 other buildings. And the campfire is now 100% contained and flying over it today, I could see no sign of any fire anywhere. One of the most common questions folks have when they look at these photographs is how come the buildings are burned and the trees are still green? Because this was such a fast moving, wind driven ground fire. Remember this started in light flashy fuels and took off at a rate of about uh, six or so miles per hour. It got from the ignition source to the town of Paradise within about an hour, driven by the high, high winds. And that creates this firestorm where you have embers the size of silver dollars landing everywhere all around you, setting off simultaneous spot fires, tiny little spot fires that you could stamp out with your feet. However, they're just all over the place simultaneously igniting fires all around you and continuing forward with the force of the wind. It's not burning up through the trees, it's burning horizontally through the trees or through the vegetation. If those spot fires hit dry wood, dry material, dry leaves, and do not get extinguished, of course, that's going to uh, continue to catch that dry wood on fire. So if it catches the wooden deck of a house, for example, uh, a pile of leaves in the corner of a roof of a house or in a gutter, and then catches the dry wood of a house on fire versus the green wood in the tr surrounding trees, it's going to burn that house to the ground. Once that structure begins to catch fire, the winds are going to drive that fire through that structure until it is consumed completely. Those temperatures will exceed a thousand degrees and will completely consume that structure. That wind's going to lay that lay that fire down through that structure and just continue on downwind. It's not going to necessarily burn up the trees around it. That's why you'll see pictures here where complete structures burned, surrounded by green grass and trees, some trees still even with their fall colors still on them. In other portions of the fire, especially after the day one of the fire storm, the wind driven fire storm, you'll see more traditional fire burning patterns where the trees are definitely damaged dying trees. Now the fire was so, the fire area is so huge um, that today I just concentrated uh, right around the uh, Paradise Megalia area. So let's go take a look at that footage and see what I got. We'll start off with this shot from the Blanco Lirio Global Headquarters just 40 miles away from the campfire at about the same elevation. And there's the fire off in the distance where thousands and thousands of Californians live in what is known as the wildland urban interface, where the population of homes built in these forests have grown dramatically over the last 40 years. Nevada County traffic lost from 71608, depart 25 from Nevada County to the northwest. Mixture is rich, bags on both. Master. Lights trim and set. Finals clear. Fuel's on the left tank. Left tank is full. Runway's clear. Well, we'll wait. Two to single 
The rig I'm using for the exterior shots is a second GoPro camera and the GoPro Karma stick with gyro stabilization. Once I get the angle set up I want, I can concentrate on flying the airplane and looking out for traffic. Here's the basic pattern for today's flight going in a counterclockwise direction about 2,000 feet above the ground. So we're heading northbound, looking out to the west, up the west branch of the Feather River, right along the eastern edge of the town of Paradise. We're in about the middle of the campfire burned area, and the fire burned an additional 14 miles beyond our present location, encompassing a total of about 240 square miles. As we discussed in Dean's interview about the hospital evacuation in Paradise, Paradise and Megalia are located on top of an ancient, relatively flat lava flow that has been cut by erosion to the east by the West Fork branch of the Feather River and on the west side by the Butte Creek drainage system. The elevation of Paradise and Megalia varies from about 1,500 feet to the south to about 2,500 feet to the north. As we turn to look to our right, to the east, towards the source, the original source of this fire, we can see the Concow Reservoir and the area of light, flashy fuel, very little timber, where this fire raced through before jumping the West Fork Canyon and hitting the town of Paradise. Many of the trees that you see still standing, predominantly Ponderosa Pines, have already turned yellow from the fire and will not survive. We've just passed the Adventist Health Feather River Hospital that Dean evacuated. We'll come back for a closer look in a minute. The parallel rows of burned structures was the Ridgewood Mobile Home Park. Just to the north is Chris Court with widely spaced single family homes that appear relatively unscathed. Here's a closer look. And beyond the park and to the left is the Ponderosa Elementary School, which appears to have survived. Here's the direction that the fire took through town, through this section. So as a wind-driven, ember-fueled series of spot fires drive through town, whether a structure survives or not becomes a matter of luck and how close it is to additional fuel. Once a structure catches on fire, the kiln dried wood inside that structure and all the other materials pushes the temperatures very high. If the structures are closely spaced, chances are once one structure gets on fire, all of them catch on fire. Now we're getting to the north end of Paradise near the town of Megalia, where Pence Road and Skyway merge, and we're looking down the Butte Creek drainage on the west side of town. This is the south end of Megalia Reservoir where we'll be taking a turn to the west. I have to be careful to keep the gimbal mounted GoPro out of the slipstream as it'll just throw the gimbal right off. You can see the blackened slopes of the canyon where the fire burned fairly completely on the eastern facing slopes. 
As we make this turn to the west, we can get a good view of the West Fork Canyon. This canyon is a thousand feet deep and nearly a mile wide. The fire embers spotted over the top of this canyon, landing in the town of Paradise before the fire burned through this canyon. Spotting was reported between one and two miles during this wind-driven event. Now we're going to continue our turn to the southwest over Megalia and head down the west side of Paradise along the Butte Creek drainage. We're right over the edge of the fire line in Megalia here, and those homes that are inside the fire line are mostly all destroyed. Here's a closer look at what some of that looks like. Again, a fast moving ground fire destroying the structures and racing through the timber, leaving much of it damaged or will soon be dying. The smoke you see in the distance is a control burn. Now that the rains have returned, folks are able to burn their leaves and debris again on their own properties. This looks like Ponderosa Way with Pine Ridge School off in the distance to the right. can't see it very well from this angle, but the subdivision behind Pine Ridge School had a fire break around it, but it was simply no match for this wind-driven fire. Way off in the east, off the left wing tip of the Luscombe, Deep in the Feather River Canyon is where this fire started, and it's about eight miles away from this point here. It took less than two hours for that fire to get to this area. Now we'll cross Little Butte Creek and look at the west side of the town of Paradise. Again, the blackened walls in the canyons indicate a more complete fire burn where the fire has more vertical fuel to work with. As opposed to the relatively level mesa top where the fire is proceeding as a series of spot fires and structure fires. On the west side of Paradise now, in the area of Wagstaff Road and Billy Road. Coming up on Skyway Road, the main drag through town, Holiday Market in the distance. Behind the white L-shaped Holiday Market is Paradise High School.
as we cross over Skyway, there's a pretty good example of some pretty dangerous planning. I see this all the time in our neck of the woods. Here's a court that's blocked off right at the edge of Skyway with only one way in, the long way in. It doesn't look like you can get out of this court over to Skyway Boulevard. And of course, Skyway is the main escape route out of town, both north and south. There's also been reports of uh, city managers putting traffic calming measures on Skyway Boulevard or on some of these main escape routes out of town. I couldn't see them from up here, but I'll have to look into that in a future update. Those traffic calming measures tend to choke traffic down, especially in the event of an evacuation. I'm going to double the speed of the Luscom here as we head southeast towards the Paradise Airport as I have a few other things I want to show you. A lot of folks didn't know Paradise had an airport. Nice paved strip on top of this tabletop. It appears to have survived just fine, but has been completely burned all the way around. It's now being used as a major staging area. We're now looking north back up into Paradise along Highway 191 or Clark Road, one of the other main escape routes. Erosion control measures are already taking place along 191, where you can see the green hydro seating taking place. These November rains are bringing some very heavy rains, and the first thing folks want to protect is the ingress and egress in and out of this fire area so they can continue to get the basic infrastructure work needed done before they repopulate. Now right up here is another example of the hit and miss nature of this wind driven event where the main structure burns completely to the ground yet the fall colors remain on the trees nearby and the grass is still green and the outbuildings survived. The main fuel here was the structure itself. Continuing north along 191 back into paradise. Now we'll make a little jog to the right around the Pearson Road area and head out towards the Feather River Hospital. Here's a series of detailed shots of various locations around town, again showing the hit and miss nature. Seems that the closer the buildings are, the more likely they were to be lost, especially in the case of mobile home parks, primarily the home of the elderly. Pearson Road, one of the most hardest hit escape routes as it was a narrow road winding through very thick timber. We're just about back where we started this tour. Let's go take a closer look at the hospital. Located right on the West Fork 
Feather River Canyon, Adventist Health, Feather River Hospital, the place where Nurse Dean Strait and his entire staff safely evacuated all the patients. You can see how hot and heavy that fire burned up the canyon wall approaching the hospital. There's much yet to learn from this disaster and plenty of work before recovery begins. A couple of things I want to say now that I've gotten a chance to take a look at the devastation firsthand. To all the first responders out there, uh, this is part of the most frustrating part of their job now is all the second guessing, Monday morning quarterbacking, uh, the after actions report and that sort of thing. Don't be beating yourselves up. There is little to nothing anyone could do once this firestorm got started. First responders did the correct thing in just evacuating and tending to their own personal safety. Getting out of the way of this firestorm was all anybody could do. And as Dean pointed out in his interview, you're not going to be able to rely on anybody else but yourself if you're caught in one of these events. You have to rely upon yourself to get yourself out of harm's way in a timely fashion. All systems, all emergency systems, all first responders, everybody was absolutely overwhelmed to respond to this firestorm. Folks simply could not respond quick enough. Now, over the years, I've watched CAL FIRE uh, mature into a huge bureaucracy organization. That and the Office of Emergency Services and all the different bureaucracies combined together to, to put together, that work together in, in one of these emergencies. And as a result of the size of these bureaucracies, they are a very stovepipe, top-down, procedurally driven bureaucracies so as such they have to follow the book and that in itself slows them down slows them down to the point where they have a very hard time keeping up with real time during one of these kind of emergencies We'll continue to follow this historic disaster as it has potentially huge fallout for nearly all of us. See you here.